was a terrible fight, I tell you. The great wolf, its teeth red with blood, bit into the neck of the fair queen Orion. Where her bloods fell to the ground, rubies the size of your fist formed. Tis said those rubies can be found scattered around the world, and whoever brings the six rubies back together will restore our precious queen to life, and she will bring about a golden age for our people. The first of the rubies has been found, so this is no child's fairy tale, but a thing of fact. It was found by the madman Miklas, who lives in the solitary tower at the edge of the swamp. He might know where more to be found, but his madness consumes him. Will you find the rest of the red rubies of our queen and restore our nation to glory? Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and of course today we are looking at myths and legends in our campaign creator series sponsored by World Anvil. World Anvil brings you these uh, campaign creator series in a conjunction with Dungeon Fog. Now, myths and legends, myths and legends, myths and legends. Where do we start? There are hundreds and hundreds of myths and legends all over the place. So what do we do? How do we how do we do myths and legends on the fly? Or at least how do we how do we even uh, well, well no it doesn't have to be like that. It does not have to be like that. How do we do a myth and a legend? Well, when we look at myths and legends, we need to first understand why we need myths and legends. What do they do for our campaign? What do they add to our game? Every culture on earth has a myth or a legend, whether it's a creation myth, whether it's a heroic battle myth, whether it's a formation of the culture or the city or the colour that can be worn on a Tuesday. It doesn't matter. There's always myths and legends. So by adding a myth or a legend to your world, you start to make the world feel as if it is natural, as if it's always been there, as if it's grown and evolved over time, which is what we want. So that's point number one. Point number two is no myth or legend should be unexplorable by the player party. Why do I say that? Most of our myths and legends we couldn't possibly go and make and explore. The um, Nemean lion, for example, in Hercules. They don't wander around nowadays. But what if they did? What if the legends of the lion that had impenetrable skin? Well, maybe it had children. Maybe it had cubs. Maybe those cubs have got impenetrable skin. So now our party can encounter them because of the ancient legend. When they encounter them, the ancient legend becomes true, it becomes more real, and the whole thing feels as if it was planned from the very beginning. Meanwhile, you were just throwing out some legends. So what legends do then, apart from making our world feel as if they are, as if it is and has always been in an existence, it allows us to throw out potential plots that our players can pick up on if they so choose, or it allows us to then embellish and add onto the current quest by hearkening back to myths and legends. Myths and legends, however, though, fall into a dangerous space. They fall into the same space as history and as timelines. In other words, they fall into that category of content that the players may just not want or may never uncover. Or you have to info dump them. How do you tell a myth or a legend to your party? And that's also part of how do we incorporate it into our campaign. You need to think long and hard, and usually it happens after we've created the myth. So, we kind of now know why we need myths in our game and what they can do to help make our game feel better and give us some options for adventures. How do we go about making a myth? A myth usually has five components, at least this is the components in my mind, that you need to talk about. So if you need to make a myth up on the fly, and frequently this happens, if you have these five components in your head, then, well, you're pretty good golden. The components in no particular order, so you don't have to worry too much about it, is, well, who? Who who made this thing? What? Who, who? Where did it come from? Was it a hero? Was it a lord? Was it a king? Was it a villain? Was it a, a 
a crab, it doesn't matter. So who made this thing? When we unpack a legend, who went on the 12 tasks? It was Hercules. Who set him the 12 tasks? Well, uh, my knowledge falls apart in terms of Greek mythology at that point. Um, was it Zeus himself? No, it was the king. Or was that Heracles that I'm getting confused with? And it was the king because he wanted the door. Who cares? We only know about the 12 tasks, right? So who is important? So who is involved in this whole thing? You need a what? What is involved? Is it a treasure? Is it an item? Is it a weapon? Usually it's one of those three things. Treasure, item, or weapon. So it is the golden fleece from Jason and the Argonauts. It is the sacred flame of the gods, if we want to go that far back. Whatever the thing is, it's usually something. So someone wants something. Do you see where I'm going with this? you see where I'm going with this? We then need to say, well, well, who did they defeat? Because ultimately there's always a conflict. Very seldom is there not a conflict. Sometimes that conflict could be, and she ate him and then vomited him forth and from the vomit spawned all the stars. Whatever. I mean, that's one of the creation myths, right? So, who, what, who did they defeat? What did they defeat? How did they defeat it? What is it? What does it do? So, it's a treasure that brings about something. It's an item that has the power to do something. It is a sword that can slay gods. So we need the weapon or the thing to have a something. And then finally, we need a location. Where is it? Is it in some buried in a rock in the courtyard in the middle of London? And him, whomsoever pulleth the sword gains the power of being the true king of Britain. Is it in a swamp? Is it in a dungeon somewhere? Is it in a different plane? Is it lost to all time? If it's lost to all time, then it doesn't really work, does it? It needs, you need to have something. So by way of example, let us say that, let's just make up something quickly. So um, we've got our hero um, who, in this particular case, let's say has the, the hero named Damados. Damados has been journeying to find his true love. Um, let's really shake it up. His true love is Atheos, the prince of a distant king. But the king did not like the idea of Demodos betrothing his only son. He wants children, and for that you need a princess. So the king sends these three winged assassins. They could fly. I don't know why they can fly. They can fly to try and defeat Demodos. And on a certain mountain, let's say on Mount Oath, Mount, yeah, Oath, okay, Mount Oath, fine. On Mount Oath, Damados faced against these three winged assailants. The first two he slew without much problem, using the silver sword that his father had given him to give to his beloved as a wedding gift. The third one, however, managed to fire off its feathers, which were all poisoned, obviously, at Damados, and three feathers pierced him. One in his eye, one in his heart, and one in his spleen. Damados, of course, then slew the beast and continued on his journey to his beloved and the king who so hated him. However, the poison from the three feathers, the one in his eye, caused him to see his lover now as his enemy, and so he cut off the head of his betrothed. The feather in his heart, I think we said heart, the feather in his heart soured him so that he had no remorse, and as a result, he killed the king of his betrothed as well, and the one in his spleen called him to, caused him to have such hatred for all mankind that Damodos then went and slew the entire kingdom. The three feathers were lodged deep within these organs, and when Damodos was finally defeated in the great battle between himself and the warrior queen Avon, Avon buried his body in the swamps of despair and hoped that the curse was now removed. Of course, the three feathers still remain buried in the body in the swamp of despair, and anyone who is said to hold the silver sword will be guided guided towards where he is. And a silver sword has popped up in the great deserts of Uk, in the treasures that are found in the uh, mausoleums that the Ukish people uh, build. Whatever. Okay. There's a whole long legend. Now, the three feathers are poisoned. They will corrupt people. They will do all kinds of funny things. By creating this legend, you create it on the fly, as I have just done. It didn't take very long. It took a couple of minutes. Your party now are not going to get all of that information. 
perhaps they come across a carving on the wall. You're seeding this. You're throwing this out. You, you, you your party is is going slowly. They're searching, and they have they have decided that they really want to search the temple that they are in. It has nothing to do with the legend. And you decide, okay, the wall has got a carving of a young man busy fighting three, it looks like harpies that are flying in the sky. But he has three feathers sticking out of him. One in his eye, one in his chest, and one in his spleen. And one party member goes, oh, um, does it look old? And you go, yes, it looks ancient. Right, I want to do an archaeology check or a history check or whatever it is that you would have them do. Oh, um, now they want the history of this this mosaic because they rolled a natural 20 or they got 89% or whatever. Now you start to spin your tail. So this myth suddenly evolves and now you've also seeded that the silver sword can be found in the temple of Uk, which maybe they're in. In which case, if they find the silver sword, well, now here's a whole nother quest, a whole nother journey, which has spawned out of this myth. Okay. But what about myths that we need to create before our campaign starts? Do we need to create myths before our campaign starts? My answer is an emphatic yes. And for that, we're going to go over to Dungeon Fog. Now, here it is behind me, as you can see there. Let me just do this very quickly. So it's behind me. I'm going to open that up. Right. Behind me is, of course, the Dungeon Fog interface that we are all very familiar with. And there is a section for myths and legends. Now, under myths and legends, when we go and create one, we can add in a whole bunch of stuff. What I would suggest that you do is that you populate a few of these templates because they are quite complicated in terms of, of stuff that they want you to fill in, which is great. So if we go to the very first step, let's go here and let's say um, great battle myth. What we're going to do, myth, right? And then I'm going to duplicate this page. And here I'm going to say great sacrifice myth and I'm going to duplicate it again. I hope this works. Uh, and let's say so great battle, great sacrifice. Um, let's say great treasure myth. OK, so we've got these three myths running in parallel. I am not worried, however, that uh, let's just save each one of these so that they are hopefully not saving over each other. I don't know how well that how smart World Anvil is. I trust that they'll be there. When we um, look at these, these are blank templates for us to use later on. The players at character creation don't care about myths. Their characters are newborns. They have just left, literally stepped out into the world. Find me a nine-year-old who is interested in the ancient mythology of Babylon, and I will be impressed. I don't think even I, at the age of seven, was interested in Babylon. I was interested in dinosaurs, but I didn't really care about the myths and stuff that went with it. That came a little bit later, a little bit. Nonetheless, the idea is we're creating templates for ourselves. So we're going to go and type in our options here. So who uh, was doing what, what, um, who tried to stop them, how did they succeed, with what did they do it, where did it happen, how did they die, where did, uh, where, sorry, is the next clue? Okay, so those questions are pretty, pretty stock standard. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to copy these here and let's just go to each one and I'm going to paste it into each one. Okay, so who was doing what? Um, or why was someone going somewhere? When your players ask you for a bit of history, Bring up this sheet because you can edit it at any time, and then you can start to just go who? Jaravos. Jaravos. Jaravos was going. This is a treasure myth. Jaravos was going to find the treasure of Kim. But guarding the treasure of Kim was Dorgoth. Dorgoth prevented, I've forgotten his first name, but that's where you should be writing it down. So you can just populate this out 
tell us what it is uh was going after what the treasure of kim uh you can elaborate a little bit more and then you can sort of fill that in all right so that's that's step one once you've done that you can then come to the summary and you can start to write it out do you do this beforehand yes you're, you're welcome to so i've got three here that i can sit and just kind of go through again answering all of these questions just working through and then i can come down later on and start to add it in now, when we start talking about Apocrypha, you know, what changed, what's not true, what is true, what's what what can the players examine and explore? All that kind of stuff is is stuff that you add on later, as far as I'm concerned. Variations. Variations are a good thing to have because it makes it feel like it's alive. But at the same time, they can complicate matters and they can get the players to kind of get a little bit confused. So be careful when you start to fill this up. There's, of course, a lot of stuff in art in you know, there's tapestries, there's mosaics, there's wall paintings. Again, you can fill in all of this information. Now, if you are just starting your campaign, as hopefully you are in terms of the campaign creator series, by having these, we've got a sacrifice myth, we've got a battle myth, and we've got a treasure myth. So if your players come across a mosaic and the theme for your campaign is sacrifice, well, now we go to the sacrifice page and we can now fill in that sacrifice page by adding in all of this extra information, if you so choose to do so. Later on, when you're running the same campaign, but with different players or with different party members or whatever the case might be, you now have this template from which to work. And you can now move forward going, okay, cool. Well, we already have that le legend that we already have that myth. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that you don't have to start it all from the beginning every single time. Build up your myths and legends over time. I have found that in, in, in my games, the legends and the myths are often the actions that the player's characters took in previous sessions, in previous games, I should say. You know there was this development that occurred uh, a great example is if you look at the save or dice youtube channel that i'm part of i was the gm for a campaign and then we had another gm for a campaign and now we're on our third gm for the campaign and they've decided it was kind of fan inspired really that all three campaigns are linked now this wasn't planned this was never planned but they linked and so what's happening is the actions that were in one of them have now become the myths and legends in another so there's this amazing evolution that's taking place that we as the players are sitting there going, oh, I remember that. Well, I remember the story of that. My character remembers the story of that. So it starts to make your world feel alive. And I think that is the most powerful element that myths and legends can add. So go ahead, populate these out. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You know how to do that. Someone wants something bad and is having difficulty getting it. That's the story that we're telling here. But what's important is how we then give it to our players. And that's usually through them finding a little clue, asking some questions. If your players are not asking questions, oh, who made that mural? Where does that painting come from? And you're throwing out clues at them. You walk into a hall and you see a great mosaic on the floor. And it's depicting a titanic battle. And they go, oh, that's cool. Uh, I go to the prince. That's as far as your myth and legend goes. So why spend days or years developing all these myths and legends if your players are not going to be interested? At the same time, if your players are interested and you have created this gigantic myth, the moment they ask, well, that wall hanging on the wall, you throw a book at them with just tons of information. It's too much. So I advocate by making it up on the fly, by answering these kinds of questions, the, those, those kinds of questions, you create just enough information for the players to go, ah, not interested, moving on. You've wasted no time. Or for them to go, a dragon with silver scales that were made out of mithril, you say. I want to know more about that. Well, unfortunately, your history check doesn't give you much more than that. But give me an anthropology check. Oh, you know that there's a professor who studied this stuff. Or a servant walks past and goes, mm, it's so nice, isn't it? We had the professor around the other day. Oh, he's an expert, didn't you know? He's three towns over. Yeah, he was studying it. He said he's found something important. I don't know. So if your player's interested, you become interested and start to develop it. Then once the players have started the trail and off they go to the professor, now you come back to World Anvil and you fill in all of the details so that when they start to then ask important and complicated questions, you already have the answer. Sit yourselves down. I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a little goblin. This little goblin had a silver bell. Where did it get that bell from, you might ask? 
It was a titanic battle between it and the house cat known as Felix. The battle took three days, the little goblin prodding and proking away at Felix, Felix clawing and biting him with massive teeth. But the little goblin didn't give up, no. But he knew Felix had one weakness. He liked the flesh of mice. So the little goblin collected up six mice that he found in the field one day and filled them filled with poison berries. And he left those mice all around. Now Felix subscribed to the idea of consuming mice whole and so picked up all six delicately by the tail and popped them into his mouth, swallowed them whole. Nary an hour had gone past when the mice inside of him burst, releasing the poison and killing Felix and allowing the little goblin to steal the silver bell from around his neck and claim it as his own, along with the prestige and the power and the glory that came from defeating Felix the cat.